Hi guys, I'm back with another few chapters uh, from Renee Watson, some places more than others. I will start with chapter eight. This has been the longest week of my life. We leave for New York tomorrow morning, tomorrow night. And it's been torture having to wait. Mom's been fussing at me all week because every free moment I have, I've been on my phone or laptop looking up things to do and making my lists of places I want to go. I have all the things Titus suggested, plus seeing a Broadway play. But more than going to any of those places, I want to sit on the stoop of Dad's childhood home. I want to see the schools he went to, the playgrounds he played on. I want to find something to bring back for my suitcase project. Mom and I are in my room packing for the trip. She's just finished oiling my scalp with coconut oil, so now my room smells like the scratch and sniff stickers I used to trade with Titus. He hated the smell of the coconut ones, so he always gave me his. Mom made a list of everything I need to bring. Don't forget to take some chewing gum in your carry-on, just in case your ears bother you when you fly. Mom says, and remember to bring some of those word puzzle games you like in case you get bored on the plane. I don't think I'll need them, I tell her. I've packed some books. Mom says, well, it's better to have them and not use them than to not have them and wish you had packed them. Dad calls out from his office. The plane has TV. She'll be fine. Mom slides the word puzzles into my bag and whispers, just she opens my closet and pulls out five sweaters. Now, you're going to need to layer yourself. Tank top, t-shirt, sweater, scarf, coat. That's way too many clothes. I'm going to be too hot. It's in New York's February. There's no such thing as too hot. Mom folds my sweaters and puts them in my suitcase. And I bought these for you, she says, handing me five pairs of leggings. You'll need to wear these under your jeans. Mom. Honey, will you tell her how cold New York is in the winter? Listen to your mom, Dad says. I hear his door close, and that's a signal to me and Mom that he's tired of hearing us fuss at each other. Mom closes my door, too. She sits on my bed and motions for me to sit next to her. I don't know what's about to happen, but my heart starts to tremble because Mom's face looks so serious. All of a sudden, not like she's annoyed with me like a moment ago, but like she has something important to tell me. Amara, I know you are planning on having a lot of fun, and you will. You'll remember this trip for the rest of your life, but I need you to do something while you're there, she says. I need you to make sure your dad and grandpa have some time alone. They need to talk. Now, you can't force a conversation, but you can encourage them to spend quality time together. Can you do that? Yes, I say, I can do that. After mom leaves my room and I am in bed, not sleeping, because who can sleep the night before visiting New York City, I lie awake thinking about what mom asked me to do. The only other time mom trusted me with something so important was the time she let me wear one of her necklaces made from red gems for my school's fancy Rose City Scholars tea. She pulled the jewelry out of a velvet pouch and talked with me about how I had to take care of it, how it's only worn on special occasions. I was proud that mom trusted me with something so precious, but it also made me nervous. I feel that way about this trip now. Excited, but nervous too. When mom takes us to the airport, I can tell she's getting emotional. A week is a long time, she says. I'm going to miss you too. Dad and mom kiss. Then he puts his mouth to her stomach and says, be good to your mom while I'm gone. I love you. Dad rubs mom's belly and I really, really love you, he says, kissing mom's lips again. Okay, okay, I shout. Mom wraps me in her arms. Have fun, Amara. Not that I have to tell you that. When she lets go, she reminds me to chew gum during the takeoff and landing and tells us to call her as soon as the plane lands. Call, not text, she says. Dad and I walk into the airport, check our bags, and get in the security line. The line isn't too long, and Dad says this is why he likes to fly at night. We'll sleep on the plane and be ready for the day once we land on the East Coast, he tells me. We get through security and sit down at our assigned gate. There are families seated with small children who are dressed in pajamas for the overnight trip. 
A few people are reading books and some are watching videos on their phones. There's a man who is bent over in the seat using his backpack as a pillow. Dad and I sit near the ticket counter. So do you have your must-see list? Dad asks. Yep. Times Square, Top of the Rock, Riverbank State Park, Brooklyn Bridge Park, 125th Street, the Apollo, a play on Broadway. You know we're only going there for a week, right? Dad laughs. I smile. There's more, actually, I tell him. More? Well, I want to see your neighborhood. Visit the places that were important to you when you lived there. A voice speaks over the intercom, announcing that it is time to board the plane. Dad stands. Ready? He asks. Ready. We board and find our seats near the front because Dad upgraded to have more leg room so his long legs won't cramp up. We get settled, seatbelts on, snacks in the pouch, on the back of our seats in front of us so we don't have to keep opening the overhead bins to get our carry-ons. I take out the activity book mom gave me just in case I can't sleep and want to do a crossword puzzle. After the safety demonstration is given, we take off. The lights dim and a few flickers of light beam over seats where people are reading. Dad puts his back seat and puts his headphones on so he can watch his favorite late night talk show. I hate to bother him, but I really want to ask him a question. I tap his arm. He pulls out the right earbud. Yes? You didn't tell me what you're looking forward to. Do you have a must-see list? I whisper because the woman across from us has an eye mask on and it looks like she's already sleeping. Dad says, well, no, I haven't really thought about that. I've just been focusing on what I need to do for work, and I want to make sure that you have a good time. But there has to be something you want to do or someone you really want to see, I say. Like, what's something we can't do in Oregon that we can do in New York? Dad thinks for a moment. Get a Jamaican beef patty. Yeah, we have to do that. It will change your life, I promise you. Dad smiles just thinking about it. I'll have to take you to the Concourse Jamaican Bakery in the Bronx. Best patties in New York City. Dad reaches for his earbud, and just before he puts it back in, he says, and I have to take you to Canal Street and teach you how to haggle for good deals. You'll like that. We can get some souvenirs for your friends. For the first time, Dad looks excited about this trip. Get some sleep, he says. Tomorrow's going to be a long day. I put my headphones on, but I'm not really paying attention to the screen. I can't stop thinking about all the things Dad and I will do in New York. I can't stop wondering what it's going to be like for Dad and Grandpa Earl to see each other for the first time in 12 years. How am I going to get them to talk to each other? In all the ways I am like Dad, this is not one of them. There is no way I could ever, ever stop talking to him or Mom. I can't imagine. I have been mad enough to stop talking to them for an hour, a night, but never whole weeks and months and years. I really hope I don't make things worse. I mean, what if I get there and Grandpa Earl isn't happy at all to see me? Because I will just be a reminder that the day I was born, his wife died. And the day I was born, he stopped talking to his son. This might not be a good idea at all. Talking with Grandpa Earl on the phone is one thing, but maybe in person things will be different. Maybe he will see me and only be reminded of the worst day of his life. I hope Mom is right about this being a good thing for me, for Dad, for Grandpa Earl. I look out the window at the night sky. The tiny lights twinkle and glow below. I know they aren't stars, but I make a wish anyway. Chapter 9 When we get off the plane in New York... The first thing I do is call mom. How was the flight? She asks. Good. We slept most of the way. Okay, well, tell your grandpa and everyone else that I said hello. Okay, mom. Love you. Love you too, Amara. Let me talk with your dad. I give the phone to dad and he says a lot of uh-huhs and yes, got it. as we follow the signs to baggage claim. Of all the things mom told me about New York, she didn't tell me that JFK is huge compared to Portland's airport. And the people, she didn't tell me 
that there would be so many people coming and going and going and coming. She didn't tell me I'd hear five languages in this one place. After we get our luggage, we go outside to stand in the taxi line. It winds and twists and is just about as long as the lines at the employee store. The cold morning air stings my nostrils and chills my insides. I reach in my bag for my gloves. Now you see what your mom was talking about, huh? Dad asks. His breath zigzags in the air, making designs that quickly fade to nothing. I nod and lean into him, resting my head on his chest. He puts his arms around me and I get just a little warmer, but then the line moves so we separate. Even though my fingers are freezing, I take out my phone so I can take a picture of the line of taxis. The long trail of yellow cabs bends around the curve. I can't see where the line ends. My first photo in New York, I say. Dad smiles. We get into the next cab and for the first five minutes we zip along the freeway making our way to Harlem but then the car slows down to a stop and we sit and sit and inch our way through traffic for the next 40 minutes. The constant jerking makes my stomach flip. Dad, I don't feel good. It's colder than cold and outside but all of a sudden I feel hot so I unbutton my coat. You might be getting car sick, Dad says. Then he leans forward and says, easy on the brakes, please. I've got sensitive cargo back here. The driver doesn't say anything. I lean my head against Dad. Think I'm just, think I'll just close my eyes for a little bit. I can't believe I've been in New York less than an hour and I'm sick. It'll pass, Dad says. He tells me to take deep breaths. I do, and it must calm me because the next thing I know, Dad is shaking me and saying, Amara, wake up, Amara, Amara, we're here. I jump up. We're here? I missed the drive? Dad pays for the ride and we get out of the car. Dad was right. Just standing up and being on solid ground makes me feel better. Better, not good. We stand outside Grandpa's brown stone. Dad doesn't walk up the steps yet. He just stands here, taking it all in. He looks around at the street, and I wonder what memories are coming back, what memories he's pushing away. All the brownstones look connected, like one long building with many doors. They stand tall like a box of crayons, except all the crayons are shades of brown. The tree-lined sidewalk is narrow, and the street is stuffed with cars parked bumper to bumper. Well, this is where I grew up, Dad says. Many good times were had on this stoop. He breathes in, out. Grandpa's house has a small garden behind an iron gate to the left side, where there's a small table and two chairs. We stand there just looking at the house. I try to imagine Dad as a little boy running up and down these massive stairs, sitting out here on hot summer days, shoveling snow off of them in the winter. Dad says, let's go in, and starts walking up the stairs. I follow him. I think maybe I should ask him if he's okay, but before I can come up with something to say, and before we even make it all the way up the steps, the door opens. I don't know why, but I take Dad's hand. An elderly man walks out, making his way down the steps. Grandpa Earl. He looks like the man in all the photos I've seen, but older, more handsome even, more real. He is real and walking toward me. I squeeze dad's hand and he holds on tight to mine. I think he might be just as nervous as I am. I hear him take a deep breath. Well, hello, Grandpa Earl says. Seeing him is like having a character from a movie or book come to life. He is here. Not just a smile in a photo, a voice on the phone. Amara, you look just like my Grace, just like her, he says. He reaches out to hug me. Being in his arms feels like trying on a thick winter coat that fits just right. I ease up a bit. He is hugging me, so maybe he is not upset with me. Maybe he wants me here. Grandpa Earl looks at Dad, says, son. Dad nods and takes our luggage into the house. 
Once we're all inside, I realize how big Grandpa's house is. On the outside, it seems narrow, but once we walk through the door, I see that the first floor is wide and long, and there's a staircase leading upstairs and another one at the back of the room leading downstairs. Grandpa Earl says, so how's my granddaughter doing? Good, I say, because I'm too embarrassed to say I feel like I might vomit that the taxi ride here felt more like a roller coaster. Well, you make yourself at home now, okay? Grandpa Earl says. I know you've had a long flight. Would you like breakfast? Dad doesn't answer. I say, yes, please. Grandpa Earl goes into the kitchen. On a cold winter morning like this, you need something to warm your bones. He takes a canister down from on top of his fridge. The label on it says oatmeal. I hate oatmeal, but I don't say anything. Grandpa Earl grabs the canister that says brown sugar on it, and he takes milk and butter out of the fridge. I've never seen someone actually make oatmeal. Mom uses these instant oatmeal packs on days when she doesn't feel like making breakfast, and she never puts sugar in it. Maybe I'll like it this way. I figured I'd put you in your auntie's old room, Amara, and your dad can sleep in his old room. That all right with you, Charles? It isn't until this moment that we realize dad isn't in here with us. He's already gone upstairs. I look at Grandpa Earl and I tell him, I'm sure it's fine. I go upstairs to find dad. The second floor has a room in the front that's a smaller version of the living room downstairs. There are two armchairs and a small sofa that looks more like a cushioned bench. There are photos on the wall so beautifully hung the room sort of feels like a museum. I stand in front of a photo of Dad and Grandma Grace. He must be five or six, and Grandma Grace has her arms wrapped around him like she's giving him all the love he'll ever need. Looking at all these photos of Grandma Grace makes me wish she were here. I think maybe if she were still alive, Dad and Grandpa Earl would be talking, and maybe we would have come to New York already, and they would have come to Oregon to visit me. Maybe she would tell me about our family, our history. I wonder what it would be like to have a grandma who is not past tense, but alive at the stove cooking breakfast, humming her favorite song, hugging me with all that love. I think of all my friends who have grandmas, who sneak them candy when their parents aren't looking, who let them spend the night and stay up late watching TV even when it's way past their bedtime. I wonder... Would Grandma Grace be the kind would Grandma Grace be that kind of grandmother? Would her house be the Mecca for family gatherings where all the cousins and aunts and uncles come together to have summer cookouts and Thanksgiving feasts? Would she tell me stories about growing up in Alabama? What stories would she share about living in Harlem? I wonder and wonder about Grandma Grace. I miss her even though I never met her. I love her, even though I never knew her. When I get to Dad's room, I step inside, close the door, and whisper, You're not being very nice to him. Amara, breakfast is going to get cold. Cold oatmeal is the nastiest thing in the world, Dad says. Dad, come on, let's eat. We walk back downstairs. I keep thinking about what mom asked me to do. I whisper a prayer to Grandma Grace and ask her to help me. Chapter 10. After breakfast, Grandpa Earl says, would you like to come with me for my Sunday morning walk? I usually stop by Lennox Coffee and shoot the breeze for a while. Sure, I tell him. Grandpa puts on a navy blue coat and a brown fedora. He slides his gloves on. I walk over to the closet and get my coat. Dad, are you coming? Oh, uh, you two can go ahead. Dad, you love coffee. You should come. Grandpa says, you'll barely recognize the block, Charles. Lots of things have changed since you've been here. I hand Dad his coat, not giving him a chance to say no. He puts it on slowly like he's thinking of an excuse not to come, but I guess he can't think of one because he starts to button his coat and heads out the door. As soon as the door opens, the cold air suffocates me. 
I take a deep breath, put my hands in my pockets. Grandpa and I walk side by side. Dad trails in back of us, close enough that he can hear what we're saying, but he is quiet and doesn't add anything to the conversation. At least he's here, walking with us. I'm glad it's dry, Grandpa says. I was hoping the snow would hold off until after you and your father left. Really? I love snow, I tell Grandpa. It doesn't snow a lot where I live. Well, it does in some parts, like on Mount, at Mount Hood, but not a whole lot in the city. And when it does, it's mostly the kind of snow that turns to ice. So we don't really get to be out in it. Well, we definitely get our fair share here, Grandpa Earl says. It's beautiful to look at from the inside, but it's not so great when you have to be out in it. But maybe that's just the southerner in me talking. But you've lived in New York for a long time. Yeah, but Alabama's in my blood. I never did adjust to northern winters. But your Grandma Grace, she loved snow. Winter was her favorite season. I look back at Dad and ask him, Did you like having snowy winters? Well, as a boy, yes. Snow meant I got to play outside and have snowball fights with the kids on the block. But once I was old enough to shovel, snow meant getting out of bed early to clear off the stoop and sidewalk. This is a start. Dad and Grandpa Earl are talking. Not to each other yet, but they are walking and talking with me, and that's good for day one. We reach the end of the block, and even though the sign says don't walk, Grandpa looks down the one-way street and crosses anyway. When we get across the street, two men are walking and holding hands, and there's not enough room on the sidewalk for all of us to walk side by side, so Grandpa steps over to the right. I walk behind him, and once the men pass us, we go back to walking together. I wonder if Grandpa Earl and Grandma Grace ever walked this way on a morning walk. What were her favorite Harlem places? What else did Grandma Grace like, I ask. Grandpa's face is the bright sun. Oh, she liked a lot of things. She loved to garden, she enjoyed traveling, and she spent a lot of time reading. My Grace always had a book with her. I love how Grandpa calls Grandma my Grace, like she is his favorite everything. We continue down the block, walking under leafless trees. The branches canopy over us. Cars honk their way down the street and come to a stop because a taxi is letting someone out of the car without pulling all the way over to the curb. A man yells out of the window, come on now. He presses on his horn and the cars behind him start honking too. And now there is a symphony of beeping horns. Grandpa keeps walking, here we are he says as he opens the door to the coffee shop. Lennox Coffee is small with square wooden tables lined up so close to each other, it seems impossible for anyone to walk between the aisles to find a seat. As soon as we walk in, the man at the counter says, Mr. Barker, how's it going? Fine, just fine. Brought my granddaughter and son with me today. He smiles and puts his arm around me. All the way from Oregon, he says, mispronouncing Oregon. The brown man whispers, Oregon? There are black people that way? (laughs) Grandpa laughs. I reckon we're everywhere, but some places more than others, that's for sure. Grandpa walks over to the bar at the counter to a seat that looks like it's been saved just for him. He hangs his coat on a nearby coat rack. Dad and I do the same. When Grandpa sits down at the bar, a steaming hot mug of coffee is already waiting for him. Thank you, he says, and a hot chocolate for her. He looks at Dad. Charles, it's on me. What are you having? Dad orders, but pays anyway. I got it, he says to the cashier. I hop up onto the stool next to Grandpa. Dad stands because no more seats are available. I look around the coffee shop. There are so many shades of brown here. I've never seen this many black people in one room, except at church. This place feels like some kind of church, the way Grandpa says. I know that's right, brother, to the man working behind the counter. They're talking about politics. The two of them talk loud as if there's no one else around, and maybe that's okay since everyone sitting at the two small tables have headphones plugged into their ears anyway. Most of them are typing on laptops or reading thick books, marking pages with highlighters. 
There are a few people talking, but not many. Grandpa Earl turns his attention to me and asks, what do you want to do while you're here? Do you have a list? I smile at dad. Oh yeah, I have a list. I tell Grandpa Earl everything on my list and halfway through a tall man approaches dad. There is shock and joy in the man's face all at once. He hugs dad tight. I've only seen dad give hugs like this to big T. Charles Baker in the flesh, man, why didn't you tell me you were in town? Quick visit, just here for a week, dad says, mostly for work. The man turns to Grandpa Earl. Coach Baker, how you doing? He holds his hand out like he's going to shake Grandpa Earl's hand, then pulls him in for a hug. When they let go of each other, the man says, I'm still hoping you'll change your mind about joining us next season as assistant coach for my community league for teens. We really could use your expertise. Grandpa Earl shakes his head. Now I done told you I'm too old for that now. I retired many moons ago and I am enjoying every minute. Grandpa Earl puts his hat on. Plus, I coached you so you should know how to coach them. He pats the man on his shoulder. The man nods. I hear you, I hear you. A man can dream though. Dad puts his arm around me and says, sorry to be rude. This is Amara, my daughter. Amara, this is Arnold, Arnold Fuller. You can call him Mr. Arnold. We went to high school together. This is your daughter? Oh my, wow. How old are you now? Almost 12, I answer. Mr. Arnold shakes my hand. It's so nice to meet you. You look just like your dad, you know? I smile. Yeah, I know. Mr. Arnold says to dad, man, I haven't talked to you in forever. You still writing poems? Still? Before dad can answer, Mr. Arnold says, your dad sure had a way with words. He was like our school's in-house Shakespeare. I swore he was going to become some famous poet one day. My dad? Mr. Arnold laughs. Dad lets out a long sigh, like he's tired of this conversation even though it just started. Yes, your dad. I was busy leading our basketball team to the city championship and your dad was crushing on the poetry slam team. I look at dad who looks like he's been caught doing something that he shouldn't have. Grandpa Earl says, we're having family dinner at my place tonight, Arnold. You're welcome to come. Dad says, yeah, come through and bring your wife. It's been a long time, too long. I will, I definitely will. He takes another look at dad. Man, Charles Baker, can't believe this. Mr. Arnold gives us another hug and walks to the barista to order. Once dad, grandpa Earl and I are finished with our drinks, we leave the coffee shop. There are so many questions swirling in my mind. We're halfway down the block when I finally break the silence and say, Dad, I didn't know you wrote poems. Well, he mentioned something about it, but I thought he meant he wrote poems for Mom. Not that he was a poet. Grandpa Earl says, yeah, your dad was always writing in a journal, always reading a book. I turn and look at Dad. I didn't know this about you. Dad smiles. Yeah. Where do you think you get your love of reading from? When he says this, I feel a soft pounding in my chest, like someone is knocking on my heart. The kind of knock a person gives when they know you are there, but aren't sure if it's okay to come in. I start thinking about what mom always says, wondering whose child I am. I think maybe I am not so different from dad. We have more in common than just our love of shoes. We stop at the corner and cross when the light changes. Grandpa says hello to every person that he passes. At the corner, one block away from Grandpa Earl's home, there's a gated playground. Even in this cold, there are men outside playing basketball. Grandpa Earl says, you remember this park, Charles? Dad nods. Grandpa says to me, we'd go to the park and I'd try to get your dad to play basketball with the other boys and he would for a little while. But before long, he was off wandering around the park or sitting under a tree with a pencil and notebook. Grandpa sounds sad when he says this. He sighs and says in a quiet, quiet voice, I didn't understand him back then. 
I look back at dad and wonder if he heard grandpa, wonder if he's listening. What do you mean? I ask grandpa Earl, loud enough for dad to hear me just in case he wants to join in on this conversation. Well, I guess I, I just didn't see a good reason why a boy would want to be writing in a journal all the time instead of being out with his friends. Charles just always had to have the notebook with him, and while Grandpa Earl stops talking and just shakes his head. I didn't understand him back then, he repeats. I look back at Dad and our eyes meet. Yeah, he's listening. But he is giving me that look that lets me know I should not ask any more questions and that I need to just drop it. So I do, for now. We continue down the block, none of us saying a word. I whisper another prayer to Grandma Grace. And that's where we will stop for today. Um, that was chapters. We ended at 11. Let's see. We started, I believe, with chapter 8. Yep. So that was chapter 8 through chapter 10 of Renee Watson's Some Places More Than Others.